much for coming. It's so great to see a packed house again. My God. Uh, the first IRL events we had were in someone's dank basement. So, hey, look at us now. This is what your support does. This is you. Thank you. Um, so, universal basic income. Brilliant. Broadly speaking, as it's very hard to define, this is the measure of, of giving everyone, sometimes adults, sometimes that means literally everyone, a regular amount of money for life, no questions asked, no strings attached, no means testing, no work requirements, nothing. There are trials underway in Finland, in Ontario, the Scottish National Party are proposing it, there are rumblings about it in Australia, in India, it's one of the major policy platforms of one of the French presidential candidates, Benoit Hamon. Basically everyone and their mum is talking about it, and there are several different ways you can look at it. You can either look at it as an expansion of pre-existing welfare settlements, as a way of communalizing the profits of certain industries, or even as a way of replacing the patrician welfare state. Uh, depending on who you ask, it's either going to save us from the misery of technological unemployment, or condemn us to further neoliberalism and the complete dismantling of the welfare state. It either paves the way for a liberated future, or is a completely misguided attempt to save capitalism from itself. Um, it's a strangely simple idea, and partly because of that, it raises a hell of a lot of questions. And uh, to shed a little light, we have our wonderful panel here, which I'm just going to introduce. We have Jeremy Gilbert to my right. Uh, Jeremy is a, cultural, is a professor of cultural and political theory at the University of East London, a regular commentator on the Labour left, and the author of Common Ground, an exploration of collectivity, individuality, affect, and agency in the neoliberal era. Uh, we have Aaron Bastani on my far left. That was unintentional. Um, <laughs> he's a, a co-founder of Navarra Media, and he's an author of the forthcoming book by Verso, uh, entitled Fully Automated Luxury Communism. And on the other far end is Joanna Biggs. She's an editor and a writer at the London Review of Books, and an author of All Day Long, A Portrait of Britain at Work, uh, which was described in The Guardian as a beautifully observed set of case studies detailing the state of work in the 21st century. And finally, we have Alex Gordon. Alex is a trade unionist, former president of the RMT and current secretary of the Paddington RMT branch, once hailed as the successor to Bob Crow. And so to kick us off, I'm going to ask... <laughs> I'm going to ask uh, Jeremy to open us up. Yeah, so Jeremy, what do you understand by universal basic income? There are lots of different ways of thinking about it. Hmm. I mean, well, is the mic working? Is it okay? Yeah. Yeah, sorry. It's one of those gigs where the lights are in my eyes, so I can't see anything. Like um, okay, future. well, you've pretty much explained it to begin with. I mean, the idea of UBI, universal basic income, I'm not sure it's the, my favorite name for it, actually. I, I mean, when I've written about it in the past, I'd prefer a name like citizen's income, but we'll stick with UBI. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it, the idea is that the state guarantees out of tax revenues a universal entitlement to all people, maybe all people, maybe all adults, um, of a certain le at a certain level, which can be debated, can be you know, discussed at length, but let's say it's a kind of working figure, you know, to begin with, around sort of 70, 70 pounds a month, uh, 70 pounds a week, rather, and, um, you know, irrespective of contribution, it's not dependent on you being working or being willing to work, it's not dependent on any any factor other than you being recognized as a, a member of that society. Um, now the first thing to say about this is that nobody is proposing that this is going to solve all social and political problems, that this is going to abolish capitalist alienation, or this is going to you know, constitute even necessarily the first step to revolution. I mean, most of the criticisms that one hears of it are essentially aimed, I think, at a sort of straw man figure, which seems to think that somehow we think this is going to be solve all imaginable social problems. Uh, it isn't, but we think it would, you know, those of us who advocate for it think it would solve some really significant problems. I mean, I think the first and most important is that one of the key changes that's happened, both, you know, locally in Britain and globally in the world capitalist economy over the past uh, few decades, and one of the processes which is still accelerating, uh, is a real, you know, shift of power away from working people, away from labour, away from workers, away from those who have to sell their labour in the market to gain income, 
uh, towards those who purchase their labour power, uh, capitalists. Uh, for various reasons, to do with the decline of trade unionism, to, not, um, to do with the shifting, changing nature of the way in which capitalism is organised, to do with uh, technological changes of various kinds that we're all familiar with. Uh, and this would be one significant way in which that power, those relations to power could be shifted. If people could be given a certain kind of baseline income, which would make them not so dependent upon wages, not entirely dependent upon wages, especially for the very poorest people being very dependent on very low wages, um, then it would you know, be a significant you know, you know, stepping, uh, step, I think, towards shifting, those balance, that shifting that balance of power back in the direction that we want it to go. Um, I think it would also, you know, in various ways, I think it would, you know, it would help to overcome some really fundamental problems that we face you know, immediately in terms of enabling people to do the kind of things they want to do with their lives, including political organising. Uh, the problem is you know, a highly precarious economy, a highly precarious labour market like the one we're faced with now, it doesn't just pr pr create the kind of problems that you would expect from low wages, from insecurity, you know, in making it very difficult for people to plan their lives, in making it people for people to plan their time, in making it people absolutely dependent upon the whims of their employers. It makes other forms of, polit other forms of political and social organisation almost impossible. And I think... Now, if we could achieve this, if we could get a certain, a, a certain baseline income guaranteed for people, you know, irrespective of, of their participation in that precarious labour market, we'd be in a much stronger position both to encourage people to engage in political organising of the kind that we all think is beneficial, but also for people to engage in the kind of entrepreneurial activity, the kind of commercial and entrepreneurial and innovative activity that we all recognise is necessary for a dynamic economy. Um, to be very clear, uh, I we wouldn't propose UBI as a substitute for existing welfare benefits. Uh, I mean, it's very well established. You know, that's a historic objective of the neoliberal right, going back to the 80s at least. That's not what we're proposing. Um, we're not proposing, you know, we're not proposing that, as I say, that this would be some, you know, absolute solution to any of the kind of social and political problems we're talking about. But we think it's a clearly understandable, achievable pragmatic political demand around which uh, a progressive left can organise in the 21st century. So, um, Joanna, what do you say to that, um, the idea that because of the particular character of the way in which work has evolved in the 21st century that makes UBI necessary because we can't rely on um, regular wage packets because those, those don't exist even where we sort of demand higher wages? Well, yeah, when I think of UBI mostly, I, um, the best conversation I had about, I spoke to kind of 50 people across the country over two years about their work. The best conversation I had was a guy on Workfare. And um, he'd been in and out of, he'd, um, you know, stood on the doll in the 80s and had a band and like just around the corner actually, Hackney, um, and used to, you know, steal electricity and um, practice there and, um, and go in and out of work for a long, basically for 20 years of his life. And towards the end of it, he would talk to. He wanted to talk to me about universal-based income. This is an idea that he was really interested in. So I'm interested. In, I'm interested in the way it does challenge these hierarchies. So what it does say about work or not work, or what it says work is, right? So um, things like care work, looking after children, elderly people, sick people, um, people. Like the way it changes what the idea of work is. So. I'm really interested in the wages for housework movement and how like UBI actually does sort of say that these things, social reproduction, right, these things do matter and their work and, and increasingly in a service-based economy they are going to be more, they are going to be work. So I'm, that's what is really exciting for me about it. If you, I mean obviously UBI can be used for the left and the right, well we're, I'm sure we'll talk about this, but for the left I think it, what it can do for women, what it can do for people at the bottom of the ladder are really interesting. Um, but Alex, um, as a trade unionist, you've previously criticised universal basic income. I was wondering if you could tease, tease out why you are perhaps suspicious of it. Well, I, I think um, Jeremy has said that he's not proposing or no one is proposing uh, that universal basic income would replace benef the benefit system that currently exists within what remains of our rather tattered welfare state. But there may be no one on the stage here tonight proposing that, but that's certainly where the proposal comes from historically. So this is a proposal which is historically a profoundly conservative proposal. It was put forward in the 19... Well, it's been put forward arguably for many centuries by various thinkers, but in the 1940s it was put forward by conservatives 
as a measure to keep women in the home as part of a stable family, to provide a universal basic income to keep the nuclear family in place against what was perceived as being the threat of its breakup uh, in the post-war uh, labor era. In the 1970s, the idea has been promulgated by uh, outriders of Friedman and Hayek, uh, people who proposed it in a form of a negative income tax. So it's trite, frankly, to say that no one is proposing uh, that this is a uh, restriction on the current rights, the few rights that we do enjoy within the welfare state. My particular problem with UBI as a trade unionist is that I think it's a, it's a misnomer. It's actually a, a universal employer subsidy for low wages. And the problem with UBI is that fundamentally it's a technocratic solution to the problems that we see that have arisen because of 35, 40 years of neoliberal, neoliberalism. And what we actually need to do is to reinforce rights at work, not to weaken rights at work by providing a universal basic income, which actually simply plays to um, a lot of middle class paranoias and vulnerability uh, and concerns that people have about the way that jobs in service industries can disappear very fast. What, what we need to do is to reinforce trade union rights, we need to reinforce workers' rights, and we won't do that through a universal basic income. We'll do that through democratic mechanisms, and there's no democracy within the model that you've laid out very briefly there of universal basic income, I would argue. So, Aaron, it's an undemocratic, technocratic, sop to neoliberalism. What say you? Well, I mean, you could say it's... Um it's a subsidy for employers, but then the same is arguably true for the NHS, for council housing. That allows for a certain depression of wages because the social wage fills in. The UBI, as has been pointed out already, been championed both by the left and the right. Historically, Thomas Paine, arguably more than 200 years ago, was asking for UBI. Hayek, Friedman, now it's on the agenda with the radical left. I think it answers two specific problems. The first is technological change, technological unemployment. I'm, I'm sure I'll bang on about that for the rest of the evening. The second, and this is really under-discussed, is a crisis of geriatric care, which is about to hit the developed world over the next 25 years, like a hurricane, okay? The number of people over 65 is, I think, uh, set to double. The number of people over 85, the number of people hitting 100, and the thing with aging is this. It should be considered a disease aging, because, no, no, it, it, it should be, and I'll tell you why. It's a, no, but it's a, it's a serious issue, because you're, the chance, um, the chance, the likelihood of getting something like Alzheimer's at 75 is astronomically higher than at 70. Or getting a heart attack at 80 compared to 75. So even if somebody has a stroke at 70 and you help them, or cancer at 75, the older they get, all of the health um, risks compound. Okay, so we're getting people, we're gonna have millions of people hitting 80. Okay, so that is a huge burden in terms of social care. And part of that's gonna require, of course, a state response. I think the NHS ha has to have an expanded role but I think another side of that will be uh, the UBI. Then returning quickly to the technological change argument, a few facts, because as Congressman Kanjorski said on C-SPAN, my favorite quote, 2008 crisis, we don't even talk about the facts. Here are the facts. 2015 study by the Bank of England, the Bank of England, okay, isolated that in the medium term, machine intelligence could lead to the loss of 15 million jobs. That's 40% of the UK labor market. 2013 report from Oxford University reached similar conclusions in regard to the US. Its authors, Carl Benedict Fry and Michael Osborne, claim that 47% of all current US jobs are at high risk of being automated, 19% at medium risk. Peter Sondergaard, research director at Gartner, claimed that one in three jobs will be automated by 2025. I think that's going a bit too far. As a result of what he calls an emerging superclass of technologies, with general purpose robotics and smart machines at its forefront, ambient intelligence, internet of things, improvements in artificial intelligence. Then I think this is a better baseline, the Millennium Project, far more conservative. Um, it's set up by a range of UN organizations and research bodies in the mid-1990s, a very credible organization. It expects a gentle increase in unemployment uh, over the next couple of decades, so it hits 16% globally by 2030 and 24% by 2050. And I think that's far more realistic, actually, in terms of what we're going to see with technological unemployment. And I'll go on to say why later on. 
okay? But 24% unemployment by 2050, what's the context of 24% unemployment, which by the way is what Greece has today? Resource scarcity, two degrees climate change, uh, crop yields going down, sea levels rising, okay? The geriatric crisis I've already mentioned, a bottom billion in the global south which is set to double, okay? Africa's population is set to double between now and 2050. The big cities at the end of this century will not be Mumbai, Shanghai, there'll be Kinshasa, there'll be Dar es Salaam, there'll be Nairobi. And because of automation, the developmental trajectory is changing. So whereas China took up those jobs from North America, from Europe, from Germany, to a lesser extent, after the 1970s, that will not be repeated this time around for this massively exploding population in the remainder of the global south, outside of East Asia, effectively. Right? Because as long as China keeps on buying new robots, as long as it's fixed capital, means costs are lower than the costs of variable capital, i.e. labor, albeit in less developed countries, like sub-Saharan Africa, like Bangladesh, like but Indonesia. You bring up the idea that um, there's it's a in trouble. The, the necessity of ca um, tackling uh, climate change as a sort of, as the background noise to all of these technological developments we're talking about here. Um, but surely the idea of relying on the progress of technology as you, as you lay it out mm. leaves that question untackled. I mean, take the, uh, the, the Australian logging industry. It's being massively, massively automated and uh, loads of people are y losing their jobs. Okay, if they get universal basic income, that's great for them, but it still means loads of trees are being cut down and there's massive environmental destruction. Well, we can talk about climate change. I mean, we'll have 100% of the world's energy will come from renewables by 2040. 95% uh, will come from solar. It's true. Solar capacity in the last, solar capacity in the last 10 years, go check it out has increased globally by capacity, a factor of 100. Today, 2% of global energy capacity comes from solar, okay? At the start of the millennium, it was less than 0.1%, right? So if it's doubling every two years, something interesting is going on. And what happens when you double the production of a certain commodity? There's something called the experience curve. The costs of production go down, the costs of the commodity go down. So the more solar, the more PV, the photovoltaic cells, we manufacture, the cheaper they are, the more competitive it is on cost with fossil fuels. So there's a, there's a harmonious thing going on there. Now that's not going to solve climate change, because so the world's already going to warm by two degrees. But in terms of renewables, that's going to happen regardless. Absolutely. Um, and so what is the um, extent to which we can rely on this um, technological progress as providing the, uh, the necessary material background for, um, for the kind of changes you talk about? <coughs> Well, I mean, I agree on the one hand with uh, Aaron's analysis of the, ten the implicit tendencies. On the other hand, the answer to your question is not at all. Um, <laughs> the, uh, yeah, the answer to the question is, that, I mean, Aaron describes a technological situation which creates a set of political opportunities mm -hmm. uh, which we can, take, we can choose to organise to take advantage of or not, uh, as has always been the case historically, given in any period of intense historic change. And, I mean, one of the reasons for proposing UBI uh, as a policy, uh, as, a, as one demand among many, um, is that it, we see, you know, as I think that is, you know, that is one, it is one response to that situation which has the potential to move on uh, political relations generally in such a way that will make it easier for us to achieve the kind of, for example, the kind of environmental goals that we, that we need to try to achieve in that context because it would weaken the power of the people who are the pr present the greatest obstacle to achieving those goals, which is capital and the rich. Um, so that's my answer to that question. Yeah, and um, just going back to something that um, Alex said um, about uh, how universal basic income could, in fact, weaken the labour force. I was wondering if Joanna, you had any any thoughts on how um, universal basic income, as it's currently being proposed by perhaps, the, say, bureaucrats in Finland, for instance, uh, figures into um, like the, its capacity to change people's lives. Um, in a precarious work. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, that it, it's sort of exciting to talk about it in an abstract way, but it m I sort of think it's cool to talk about it in a concrete way. So literally, like, that, the one they did in Canada, they found out that you know, boys would stay in school later on, get better grades, get better jobs. Like you almost, sometimes you're talking about better quality work because people are willing to hold out. Um, and because they've got a bit of money to tide them over so they can get a, a better sort of job. We're talking about less work and that sort of, in some ways, that might link with the climate change we're talking, thing we're talking about as in it's because it's less growth, less people going to work, a bit more space in people's lives to think about different things, to, you know, read capital all the way through, maybe in German. But it's interesting, you... <laughs> <laughs> if, 
if you it's more free time for recreational yeah. masochism. Okay, yeah. great. Um, <laughs> like, but you, it's interesting you talk about um, it as, as inculcating less growth, whereas in fact a lot of people hail UBI as a way of stimulating growth, as a kind of way of ensuring basic demand when you know wages aren't providing that, when people just have less cash in their pockets. And so you have big cash injection, helicopter money, brilliant. Capitalism just kind of keeps on rolling. Yeah, and we can talk about full employment. Full employment has been a historic kind of on the left, but what if we're thinking about like, you know, low growth or no growth society? And then UBI can play into that in a cool way as well. And that's the thing that can How so? to climate change. Well, but because you're like, it's sort of less work, less people going to work, less people doing things, like just actually a more space in life for all these other, you know, a absolutely. Other but stuff. Um, there's, uh, I guess, this seems to collapse two different parts of the UBI debate, which is less less work, as in like less um, and less production, and those aren't necessarily the same things. Because if technology has replaced production, fewer people going to work doesn't necessarily mean that we're producing less. Um, and so it it can be sort of, as Alex was pointed at, has pointed out, it can be sort of um, reconciled with the the go goals of neoliberal growth. And I was wondering if you could um, you could pick up on that. Well, look, I think um, the UBI proposal it depends on uh, a belief in a benevolent dictator, because if you if you ask a room of people um, if they like UBI you generally have to pitch a number at them, um, which is generally, if it's above their current income, they might think it's quite a good idea. Uh, if it's below their current income, they might be less keen. And that's kind of what the Swiss referendum uh, demonstrated. So it's a bit of a silly question asking people what they think about UBI in the abstract. The question is what you think about it in the concrete. And concretely, there is no democratic mechanism for agreeing what a acceptable level of UBI should be. But beyond that, it does play, it does play to the disempowering uh, purposes of neoliberal strategies in, in, in terms of the workforce, the How global so? workforce. Because what it seeks to do is to take away the argument about the control of the means of production. This has been the long-term argument that the left and the labor movement and the working class movement globally have fought for, for arguably, you know, getting on for 200 years, the control of the means of production. And what UBI does is it says the control of the means of the production is irrelevant, it, it can be canceled out of history, it is no longer something that we should fight over or even discuss. What we should be discussing is how many pennies the benevolent dictator is going to throw at your feet. So it's fundamentally in line with everything that neoliberalism has been preaching at us for 35, 40 years. I mean, and absolutely, I mean, it, that's going back to the critique of the Gotha program, right? It's 1846, something like that, um, where Marx is saying that, li listen, we don't, we can't focus on distribution, that misses the point. Um, but before I go over to Aaron, I actually want to pick you up on, um, something that you were saying earlier about, um, I guess, okay, if we don't have UBI, then what next? You were talking about um, union organizing, I guess, as a way of, as a more democratic means of um, ensuring that wealth is evenly shared throughout society. But, I mean, look at where we are. Union membership has plummeted. And if you look at the uh, kind of constituencies who are best represented by uh, unions, it's white men, you know, once again, Women and people of colour are out in the cold. It's true. It's, it's absolutely. Um, it's rubbish. Most trade unions are women. Women are the majority of the trade union movement. Absolutely. Yeah. But the people who are like overrepresented in precarious work are also women. Like, and those are exactly the kind of um, constituencies which are like left out of the discussion of how we can use trade unions as a democratic means of pushing for alternatives to UBI. But if you do have a question, I'm sorry, James forgot to say this throughout the, um, uh, at the beginning. If you do have a question, uh, please raise your hand. At the end, at the end. Sorry. No worries. But were you sort of addressing a question to me a minute ago? Um, 
Oh, I mean, I sort of, I kind of swerved to the gentleman in the front there, didn't right. I? Um, yes. How do you guarantee that it's a genuinely democratic process when lots of people aren't represented? Well, the, of, co of course, you do it through class struggle. The, the, the point is you have to, you, democracy isn't uh, a given. You have to fight for democracy. Um, that, that is the point of democracy. You have to fight for it. And so there are, it's absolutely true what you say, that the number of people in trade unions in this country is half of what it was in 1979 or slightly earlier when it was around about 13 million. It's now down to just over 6 million. And at the same time, the workforce has increased. Um, but it's, it's also true to say that the majority, as um, Jeremy pointed out, the majority of trade unionists in this country uh, are women. Uh, and trade unions certainly do spend, certainly my trade union does, uh, quite a lot of time organising precarious workers in the transport industry. So these aren't exactly neglected sectors, they're just very difficult to organise. And the point is, how do we best go about organising them? I don't want to turn this away from a discussion about universal basic income to <laughs> my pet elite. subject, but I'm very happy to. <laughs> uh, but, but, uh, but, sure. <laughs> but, but, but I think, can, can, I say, can I say something about technology that, you know, it sort of feeds As into what Aaron was saying. Actually, I'm just going to pass over to Aaron first, and then we'll come back to you about technology. Cool. Yes, yeah, so the, there was a great line in an Economist uh, magazine from a couple of years ago. I don't read it. It's trash, but this, is, this has been passed in a secondary literature. <laughs> and it was a great line. It really caught my eye. And it said, what do you do when capital becomes labor, when labor becomes capital? For which it says, this is arguably the second machine age. The first machine age is the Industrial Revolution. All of a sudden, we have the steam engine. Machines are now capable of mechanical work, right? They can do physical pushing and pulling, propulsion motion. For, formerly, it was horses and oxen. Now, if we're getting to a, a moment in the next couple of decades where technology steps up and is able to increasingly do more cognitive work as well as physical work, which is why they have that label of the second machine age, that underpins, arguably, the end of the distinction between capital and labor. Now, it's not going to go completely. There are going to be jobs that humans can do that robots can't for a long time because it's called Moravec's paradox, right? We always thought that playing chess and mathematics required huge amounts of computation. We now know that a computer which can beat Garry Kasparov can't pick up a paperclip, right? So if you want to automate an entire labor force, it's going to take decades. But I think it's a prospect this century. And so the left needs to get ahead of uh, that discussion. In terms of disempowering, Capital is disempowering labor because it's replacing, as it has done for the last 200 years, variable with fixed capital, people with machines, with automation, with algorithms, increasingly with artificial intelligence. So, no, no, so all we disagree then is about the appropriate political response because the, the policy here is no more disempowering than JSA. I mean, or... In my, no, no, a form of unemployment insurance, unless you think unemployment insurance is a bad thing. I mean, nobody's employed all the time. They'll clearly, even in socialism, there'll be moments where you're between jobs, unless it's a complete command economy. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> I'll finish with this. Any, I'll finish with this. My, 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 my ambition is not socialism. My ambition is communism. What's communism? It's a society beyond scarcity. Okay? Thank you. It's a society beyond... <laughs> It's a society beyond scarcity, abundant energy, abundant resources, abundant time and freedom for human beings. UBI, and this is my only primary defense for it, right, alongside dealing with these crises, is that it allows us to create the production models, the lifestyles, the ideas in our heads beyond what Marx called uh, um, the realm of necessity, which is the realm that's been what our species has been confined to since we were upright in the savannah. Even our predecessors, even Homo erectus, Homo hybridensis, they lived in the world of necessity. Communism is a realm of, uh, of freedom, okay, of post-scarcity. And if we're going to prepare ourselves for a world of leisure, or as Keynes called it, living wisely, agreeably, and well, I think UBI is very smart in acclimatizing our, our, our ideas and how we produce, how we consume, to a very different kind of world. Wow. You can all go home. Um, uh, there's a hand in the back. Uh, yeah, um, basically, uh, uh, what's it called? UBI came in. What you do is have a massive discussion between the right and the left. And especially the right has kind of made Trump and the pair. And what you're saying is that there is a very strong right and a very strong left. And the left is not going to be able to get the UBI themselves. What you open ourselves as a lever to push through is another tool. For instance, attack, 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 
So even though the representation that everyone gets UBI, when they come into a place, if they come into the country, they get UBI on the job, or you then say there's actually a class difference between immigrants and then the home population, which is a terrible idea. Or, like, you just end up having this, we were in the previous situation where you're giving even more fuel to the pet, you're giving more fuel to Trump, you're giving more fuel to a pet, but they're completely uh, victimizing immigrants by saying, yeah, it's raining our economy, but we're letting people in and paying the best way. Yeah. Where's all the money going? It's going to immigration. So, like, what's the point when all of us pretty much agree here on this capitalism? And that we have to attack capitalism of putting in this band aid that can be used for racist rhetoric in this country. So, um, I'm going to open this up to Joanna and Jeremy for a bit. So, who is, who is this universal? that we talk about when we talk about universal basic income, because there's a lot of, it easily allies with uh, a citizen's income, and obviously citizenship is attached to nationality, um, and it's quite a slippery question in which maybe, as our, as our speaker said, this can be recouped by the right. Um, what are you thinking? Um, I think Jeremy should go with this. I mean, we have to <laughs> defend it for immigrants and everyone, right? That's the point. Rich people, poor people, it has to be like a kind of like child benefit situation, right? That's my feeling. Well, or look, thought. the argument that's just been made, like with respect, like every single argument Alex has made, is simply an argument against any kind of benefits whatsoever. Like you, none of you have made any arguments that couldn't, if they're true, that the, and these are the arguments that the radical left historically made against the welfare state, in fact. They said this is just a bad, this is just, this is just giving people, you know, this is just assisting the perpetuation of capitalism, that we should just, all we should be doing is organising for the immediate substitution of capitalist social relations. Um, so that's my answer initially. I mean, that's, a, that's just a question which applies to any kind of benefit, any kind of entitlement. It's not specific to UBI at all. I mean, I think on the question of immigration, I mean, if you, if you want to come into the concrete situation of, of, of immediate British politics right now, I mean, it's true, it's a very difficult, and UBI would be a very difficult thing to argue for, with a, especially with constituencies who've been saturated with a kind of anti-welfare and anti-immigrant discourse by the right-wing press. And I'd say about that set of issues that will... Sooner or later, we have to tackle that. Sooner or later, we have to tackle that entire complex of issues, and we have to win over working-class people from you know, the kind of nonsense that they've been, you know, subject, they've been subjected to for decades now, especially by the right-wing press. And if we can't do that, then we're not going to win any of what we want, UBI or, or a, a progressive immigration policy or anything else. So that's that. I, I also think that... Um, you know, none of this, no one is arguing against trade union organisation. No one is arguing against organising for control of the means of production. The fact is that right now in Britain, we're not in a pre-revolutionary situation. If you think we are in a historical situation in which the immediate substitution of capitalist social relations by some more progressive alternatives is, is, ne is near, nearly on the historical agenda, you're totally deluded. Now, I have nothing, I just don't have anything else to say to you. Now, what we're talking about is, a strate is, a, is, a, is that given the actual strategic situation we are in, now, what could we do? What is one among many things we could do which could help to alter the balance of social relations and indeed class relations that would push us further in that direction? Of course, if it was just, of course, if there was no democratic element to it, of course, if it wasn't part of a broader push for political democracy, it would just be technocratic. But so would anything. So would more money for the NHS. So would more money for schools would just be technocratic and centralising if it's not accompanied by a push for democratisation. Of course, you know, there's, of course it could be used in, in bad ways. But, and of course, it, in terms of its history and its historical progeny, I mean, it's not actually true that UBI has been a historic right wing done. And as you correctly alluded to, Alex, what the right historically have argued for is what they used to call a single tax benefit transaction or a negative income tax, which is actually a different demand historically to demand for basic income. Basic income has been part of the programme of left-wing movements, of anarcho-syndicalist movements, of communist and social democratic movements at different times since the 1890s. You know, the idea that it's just a right-wing idea is just historically inaccurate. But broadly speaking, I'm going to say, if, if any argument you want to make against it, ask yourself, is this also an argument against any kind of benefits whatsoever? And therefore, you know, am I going to defend the welfare state at all, or am I just going to commit myself to the historic sort of revolutionary fatalist idea that we should simply, you know, be immediately demanding a transformation of capitalist social relations and any other, any form of, you know, state entitlement is just retarding that process? But if that's your position, then fine, but this is really the wrong argument to be having in that case. Um, Alex, would you like to come back up? <laughs> 
yeah, well, I'm going to pass that back to you briefly, and then thanks. we've got a well, variety well, just, of just, hands. Just, just briefly, I mean, that's not at all what I said, um, but thanks for summarising my position so incorrectly. Uh, the, the, I, I, don't think, I don't think the demand for trade unions has ever been regarded as a pre-revolutionary demand, uh, other than by people who are extremely reactionary. Uh, it, it, the fact is that the point about trade unions is they're the fundamental organisations of democracy for working people. They were the organisations that working people invented and gave birth to as part of their struggle for rights and for economic rights as well as political rights. Not so, for domestic workers, though. Well, there were domestic work. There were attempts to work, organise domestic workers in, in the 19th century, but the, and, and there are attempts to organise hotel workers today. I mean, that's simply again not true. No, I mean domestic, like un unpaid domestic workers. Like I'm talking about women essentially. Yes, the question of the division of labour within the household. Mm. Quite, you're quite correct. That is something that has been in the private sphere and needs to be socialised mm. so that we can organise it in a social fashion. Yeah. But that is not going to be solved by UBI. The, 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 well, how can else I, would you, what, what can would I pass you do back to Joanna on that? But what would you do then if, if UBI isn't the first step towards pushing back and trying to value this labour that's been invisible, right, because it's in the home and privatised, but then also like, what, what other ways of doing it are there? Well, no one uh, that I've ever heard proposes that UBI is a way of valuing the labour of people who work in the home. John McDonald does. It's, no, no, it's not a matter of valuing... <laughs> no, no, no. It's not okay, a matter of valuing their labour. It may be, it's a universal benefit. Mm -hmm. So it goes to everyone irrespective of their labour. It is not a value of their labour. This is a different... Ca this is a categorical difference between what you're saying and, and what UBI actually offers. You know... Sure. I have um, a, a hand, a uh, lady who's been waiting delightfully patiently, just there in the white. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so, um, yeah. Do you want to stand up? Just stand up. Um, so, our hotel Dallas the other day. <laughs> Revenue to work with ratio. And then everyone gets paid a little bit. So this kind of gets over the issue of uh, the switch issue, which is like we don't want to pay a ton kind of taxes to this stuff. And also it kind of gets over that thing like, around this is just going to be like a way to kind of, you know, to try to work with it because there's nothing like, to do with taxation spending. It's the right thing that, so, you know, by virtue of the fact that as a taxpayer, you are a shareholder in a company which is then paying you a little bit. And this also relates to, you know, that there is companies are only able to produce these things because they're inside and what they're distributed. And it does two things it should be doing anyway, right? It moves towards taxing economic rents rather than labour, uh, and it moves towards the socialisation of finance. Um, so, yeah, allowing us to kind of become shareholders in the country. Um, and I would also say uh, that, yeah, so there's a kind of gender element to this as well because. I think the big thing that the UI or whatever does is it kind of undercuts this ideology around work, which has so much to do with the male ego and um, as a dignity. And um, completely, <laughs> completely um, kind of de legitimizes care work over the place. Um, so um, I'm going to open this up to Aaron. Um, so how do we how do we fund UBI such that it's I guess a, a way of communalizing the the dividends of, of businesses? Well, quickly about the socialized finance bit. I mean, it's absolutely true. We need to socialize finance. It's really important. And I think UBI, um, you know, this is where it gets kind of uh, speculative. UBI for me wouldn't necessarily be in pound sterling. It'd be a time limited currency, so you'd have to spend it within 12 months. We'd do astronomical things for demand. It would probably be, um, probably be a cryptocurrency, so people couldn't use it for you know, criminal purposes. Um, and I think you'd probably have a new bank issuing it, because this is a lot of money when you think about it. You're looking at hundreds of billions of pounds. Why would you want that to go into deposits of HSBC, Barclays, Lloyds? You'd have a state bank doing it. You would then have a universal guarantee, not just with the UBI, but also for access to banking, bank accounts. Millions of people don't have that right now, right? It's hugely disenfranchising. And this bank account would be where the UBI is deposited. So for me, if I'm thinking about what UBI thinks, looks like, I think, given these the early days of a mature discussion around its 
you know, its uh, advantages, its disadvantages, how may it be deployed, I think the, uh, you know, the issue of socialised finance is really, really, really pertinent. Huge sums of money. You know, I don't think, for instance, I think it shouldn't be a citizen's income. Everybody with an NI number would be able to get it. Okay? Anybody with, an, anybody with an NI number in the UK, will be working or not working, you've got an NI number, you can get it. And they'd also have access to banking, which would be incredibly powerful for a lot of people, believe me. But if it's universally accepted, what stops it, you know, just being eaten up by landlords? So it would be attended by three things. You would pull housing, education, and healthcare completely out of commodity circulation. Okay? <laughs> Sorry. But I forgot to stop. I forgot I forgot to stop. mention that bit. <laughs> okay? No, but this this rather hits on hits on uh, quite a Oh no, health is already kind of done. It, it we did that before, we can do it again. I mean, that's not outlandish. The UBI stuff's more outlandish than that stuff. But aren't we putting the cart before the horse? Well, no, so I'd say that it helps with the geriatric crisis. Uh, geri no, geriatric. no, I mean, that's, that's, I, mean, I get it that it helps with the geriatric crisis, but what you're talking about is UBI is meaningful in a set of, yeah. um, in a set of like social Jeremy circumstances yeah. which render UBI less helpful. UBI is, is not... You see what I mean? UBI is not communism, okay? I want communism, but the point is... Okay. In the meantime, you, you pull a... But FDR in 1944 outlined what he called a second Bill of Rights. And there's a great line in it, although it's gendered. It says, necessitous men are not free men. Necessitous people are not free people. We are dependent on landlords. We're dependent on employers. We're dependent even on the state and companies for a whole bunch of goods that shouldn't be commodities. And I think the three most important, housing, health care, um, what's this other? Housing, health care, education. <laughs> you pull them completely out of and research as an, as an adjunct to education, you put them completely out of commodity circulation, and the UBI stuff is uh, meaningless without those three. Otherwise, I think, you know, Alex is entirely right. It would be, it would represent, you know, it would just be the marketization of the welfare state. It would be like the Tories talk about tokens for fucking schools and for healthcare. That's what it would become. But so unless it was part of a very left-wing socialist project, of course it would be, uh, it would be the opposite of progressive. But what does it mean to demand universal basic income in in the context in which we're currently demanding it. I mean, Jeremy, you um, wrote an article for Navarre, um, which is uh, 10, uh, 10 principles of, uh, the name escapes me, but it was um, 10 ways to socialism or 10 things. 10 point to program for 21st point program. century socialism. Thank you socialism. so much. Yeah, um, yeah but what interested me- Struggling to remember myself. There we go. <laughs> was, a, uh, was the other nine points in which uh, universal basic income was embedded. So why, why need universal basic income? Why, why is that the flagship? Why is that the symbolic victory? Well, it isn't necessarily. Okay. I'm not saying it is. I'm not saying you know. I'm he I'm here arguing for it as part of a program, but to say, to to you know, to put it in isolation as as the only um, kind of demand, obviously, it would be very problematic, and, it, and it, under current political circumstances in Britain, it would be completely fatal. I mean, it wouldn't, you know, it doesn't. It, ap it appeals to the constituency who we already have on side, you know, the, the, the radical left. So. Um, I think it would have to be part of, it would have to be part of a programme and the, the core element of that programme would have to involve exactly as other people, everyone else on the panel has said actually, in, in, including Alex, would have to include, you know, democracy, you know, radical democratisation, radical decommodification of services and indeed, you know, moves towards, you know, workers control in industry. So it would have to be part of all of that programme. I think, it, you know, it, it, remain, it, it retains a particular kind of importance, as Aaron keeps saying actually, because it does signal something about our aspiration for a society and a way of life in which the drudgery of work doesn't totally define people's identity, doesn't totally define people's life world. You know, and that is a historic ambition. It's been a historic ambition of the radical movements for hundreds of years. You know, and it's, and it's ne that is why I think it's so important. It's not, of course it's not the only thing. As I've said, all, all of those other elements of the program would have to be there for it to be meaningful and for it not to be captured. Uh, as, any, as anything, uh, any isolated demand can be captured by our enemies. But its particular importance is that, I think, that the fact that it signals the, the, our belief in the possibilities of human life and human creativity being deployed in ways which are not entirely immediately captured by the processes of commodity circulation and alienated labour before they've even started. So we had uh, a couple of questions, and I have Thank you, everyone, for your patience over the hands. Um, we ha we're having a uh, round of questions after the break as well. If you've got your hand up at the moment, stick your hand up again, Ben. I know who you are. I will get to you, I promise. OK, um, it's just over there. Hello. Just project. You'll be fine. <laughs> Back to it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm going to get to the 
Um, so one is very, like, a little very simple. So what, what about the general definition of labor? And how does that actually mean to make that um, iterative on the API? Um, how, how can we like, basically assess um, UBI against weights things that are like weights? Arguably, um, automate care work, and um, how does that? How do we how do we like do that to create like future automation? Mm. So, um, Joanna, I was wondering if you could uh, pick up on this. So, the first one about how how would it kind of reorient the kind of hierarchy of gendered labour, um, and I guess I, I would. would try and talk about how wages for housework with that as well. Wages for housework is really useful because it, I, it does this thing of making the invisible visible and says, I don't know, fuck you, we've been working for a long time doing some really shit stuff and you haven't noticed and, you know, come on. Um, and, I mean, some of this is happening naturally because it's talking this thing about the kind of service sector changing. I mean, wages for housework, again, that's part of a feminist program. It's one element of things. I mean, I don't think all just by paying people for doing things they don't even practically want to do doesn't exactly solve some of these problems, but it does try and say like, you know, you know, this, this is work basically, and that's an important thing I think to say. Um, and UBI sort of does that sort of, sort of naturally a little bit, I guess, just does the sort of this thing. But um, do, do you think there's a, there's a fault with the fact that it doesn't, it doesn't explicitly target domestic work, that it is this kind of blanket policy? Um, well, I hope there's a resurgence in the women's movement anyway, generally, so that there will be <laughs> some people saying that this is what it could be used for, that feminists will say that it would be useful. Um, I think, obviously, if we want to try and get it, we need the broadest coalition possible. That means, like, all those women in those pink hats who um, marched at the beginning of the year, we want all of those people to sort of see the point of it. Um, and I don't know, I sort of prefer wages for housework because it's more of a more clearer in some way, but um, I do. So, sorry, just to clarify, you pre you would prefer? I mean, given the choice, you would you would prefer wage to housework over UBI? Is that fair to say? Um, no, that's a bit too far. But okay. I mean that, like, to 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 talk about it in that way is a, is an interesting and useful thing for me. I find personally. Um, uh, I just feel like I'm missing loads of bits out of your question. <laughs> Or well, maybe I mean, we'll go to Aaron and come back. How does it, like, how does universal basic income help not just uh, value the the nature of the work that largely women do, but actually transform it? Yeah, uh, hi, yeah, just gives them more freedom, as everyone was saying, and a chance to push back against it and say, like, okay, maybe I do want to spend this time with my baby, or maybe I do just want to spend this time making art or like organizing politically or other things that you might want to do but that's, just push that's back against work in this way i mean and women are allowed to do what, it, what they want to do right like i mean freedom no? i mean yes i mean in theory i'm, I'm yeah I'm very behind that but um i guess uh, we, we we're circling back around the the thing that um has been Irritating Jeremy, which is saying that you know we, you can't you can't separate any leftist demand from like a, from a leftist program, but it is the case that universal basic income wouldn't provide that on its own. If you see what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Which is, I guess, why it might be useful to say and say that UBI could be seen as a sort of wages for house. But do you know what I mean? Like that you, you've got to argue it in different ways, I guess, right? Okay, I think different constituencies. Um, there was another hand in the back. Hello. Um, am I just not seeing people over here, or just people kind of? Oh yes, sorry, of course. Because there was a specific request yeah. about. The oh yes, I'm sorry, I forgot the que question for Aaron. Thank you for picking me up on that. No, that's right. <laughs> so I'll be quick, just because it was um, no, the only course. bit that was specific to me was about the automation of care. So what we're seeing now is that um, labour has real leverage in specific areas. So historically, that meant mining, transport, because these couldn't be relocated. These couldn't be subjected to what's called the spatial fix. Uh, in addition to that, we're now seeing areas which are incredibly labor intensive. They're very difficult to automate. Nursing, teaching, and by the way, these tend to be the most expensive uh, services, right? Because they're so labor intensive. Care, you know, care, education. We all know how expensive university degrees are. Not just here in the United States, graduate, edu uh, graduate education and so on. So can we automate that care? Should we automate that care? No, in a sense, in a sense these are the outliers in terms of what's happening. We're seeing, for instance, with warehousing, distribution, manufacturing, 
service work, all of this can be entirely automated. This is the stuff that can't. And in a world, I've already talked about a crisis of geriatric care, there's also a crisis of mental health. The World Health Organization says that by 2030, depression will be the world's number one cause of health burden. By 2030, right? Incredible. So between aging and between a crisis of elderly care, I think the wages for housework thing in that context seems almost old. You know, it's not about rearing children anymore. It'd be more about looking after your two senile parents. No, but it's... I mean, a, I, would you still housework? You know, of course, but the, the, the material nature of it, it is a bit different now. So it will be about mental health. It'll be about looking after the elderly as opposed to necessarily rearing the next generation. China, great example, one-child policy. You've got kids, tens of millions of people growing up. They've got two parents they have to look after on one wage. They've got kids themselves. That's not manageable. You're, you're broken by that. So, and again, again, their wage can't cover all of that. So in that instance, again, a social wage will be very, very productive, very helpful. Alex, do you, do you want to come back on that? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's not manageable within a, a nuclear family. It's uh, manageable within a collective context. That's the point. The, 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 what, what, I, what I want to just focus on, uh, I'm sorry, am I meant to be responding to the question? Because I, mean, I don't really want to go over what's been said, but... I mean, you can, you can respond <laughs> to the question or to Aaron, or you can well, just talk what, about universal basic... What, what, I really, what I'm sort of burning up... <laughs> what I'm burning up to say is that I think people are... Or some people on the panel have wrongly characterised the period that we're in. Um, no one is saying this is a pre-revolutionary period, um, although things might change. Uh, but uh, but, uh, but the, the point... Well, I don't think Re Mélenchon is a revolutionary, but he's certainly... He's certainly better than Amon, who supports university, universal basic income. Uh, so the, 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 the point is that we're not in a period, in this country at least, when technology is massively replacing human labour. We're in a period when employers have been able to depress the price of labour to an historic low uh, in, a, in, a, in a way that they haven't been able to do since the 19th century by demobilising trade unions, by smashing up uh, the legislative and statutory protections which we enjoyed after 1945. And because of that, they're not using technology to replace uh, people. They're using people at very, very low wages. Now, what we need to talk about here is how we get better jobs, how we increase productivity, how we share work, okay? People are saying that there's loads and loads of jobs going to go. Well, good. We should be calling for a 30-hour working week and everyone to have a job. We should be talking about a 20-hour working week. I mean, the, the idea of sharing labour rather than, rather than putting everyone... rather than making everyone into some sort of surf in, in receipt of a sum of money not, seems, to have, escaped, about surf, seems to have escaped the attention of the Alex, people who are proposing you. What part of that do you think we do, I don't agree with? Which part of that do you think I don't agree with? Or which, and in what way is UBI in any way mutually exclusive with, with well, any of you just uh, any of what you've just asked for? Especially the low In what way is it mutually UBI exclusive? UBI is a subsidy to low wages. But to only, it would only be wages. a subsidy for low wages if the labour movement remains weak under the conditions you're describing, in which we succeed in reinflating the power of the labour movement. Precisely the objection you refer to for UBI wouldn't apply. If the trade union movement was strong, then UBI could not be a tool with which to depress wages. I mean, that, that, um, in certain trials in, for instance, in Canada in 1974, did indicate that people were able to hold out longer before taking a job, I'll say, um, I'm which does um, imply that there would be some kind of fill-up to the labour force, possibly, in a UBI situation. I'm going to say something else about this. This is an argument we should have been having 40 years ago. Okay. Yeah, the response of the trade union movement in this country... With the, with the wave of automation, the wave of globalisation, the wave of deindustrialisation in the 70s and 80s, was just to close its eyes, put its fingers in its ears, say, no, 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 we could turn back the tide. Now, UBI emerged then, not just on the right, but on the left, as part of a potential set of demands for a form of welfare state which would have, which would have recognised the reality of post-Fordism. I am and sure that there will be many trade union let me finish. Let me finish the sentence. Who I mean, agree I with you, UBI. Sentence. Okay, gentlemen, please. Let me finish the sentence. Let me if, you, if we had, had realised that vision in the 1980s, which accepted the reality of what was happening to the global economy, to the automation of sections of the economy then, 
and made UBI part of a general programme for reimagining a welfare state to enable people to cope with the reality of post-Fordism without being subject to precarisation, without being subject to this massive depletion of wages, then we'd be in a much stronger position than, than we are now. Okay. Now, if we had done this when we should have done it in 1981, instead of pretending that the changes that were coming were not coming, or were the changes that happened were reversible, and I lived through it, as I'm sure you did, I lived through the deindustrialization of the north of England, you know, if we had if we if we accepted what was reality then, that we would not be in the position we are now, so and we you know we we must not repeat that mistake again. Off the back of that subjunctive history, I want to take the final question of um, of this particular part of the proceedings, and then we're going to go have some bevs. Um, <laughs> Well, for comment and question, actually, Great. goes to the, um, if a husband and wife are going to receive universal basic income, who's going to be the one washing the nappies? You really think that's going to change? That's not wages for housework. Um, my question is that what is the, what is the, what is the difference between universal basic income or the strong social democratic state, as we saw post war where you have a generous welfare system, rent controls, Strong trade unions and full employment. What is the difference? Is there a difference? Um, I'm just going to turn this over to Aaron. Also, add to that that the social, the welfare state has been criticised by the fact that it was funded by colonial wealth. Um, how do we, <laughs> you know, avoid that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it wasn't Britain. Britain managed to pay down a massive deficit, build, build the welfare state, and maintain an empire because of that. But countries like Sweden. Um, Denmark, less so, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, of course, Britain was very, that's very much the case. Um, is there a difference? Well, arguably not, right? We're talking about value and time and labor, and fundamentally, if you're a society where housing, education, healthcare are outside of commodity circulation, you earn 600 quid a week working 15 hours, how different is that to UBI? Not all that different. I think the argument I'm making for UBI is it's a achievable demand around creating different kinds of produ production consumption models, different kinds of social relation, um, and empowering people to, this just sounds so cliche, I sound like Macron, it's, it's about empowering, <laughs> empowering people, but new production models, right? If you want to go out and start um, a business, or you want to start a printing press, or you want to start a bar, or you want to start a cafe, or you want to start, you know, making clothes, the point is, and this is a bigger part of that conversation about socialized finance, individuals should have the capacity to do that. And I think the limit with the social democratic post-war state is the ability to temporarily drop out, perhaps, of the wage relation, to take risks, to try new things. Um, that's probably the, the major difference for me, although face, you know, sort of taking both on face value, there's not that much difference. Of course there's not. It's about giving more surplus time to workers. And Joanna? Um, well, I've, this exactly plays into the, this idea of, is it, of, of what happens when you give a man and a woman this money and what, what will that happen then? I mean, basically, I don't want to legislate inside people's homes. They can organise themselves exactly how they want to do. But the idea of ages of house sex should be around. You know, it should be possible for the women to grab hold of that and talk about it and say, that we have this money, what happens now? I think that, that seems fundamental. It's exactly what Aaron's saying. Yeah. What happens now is we go for a break. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Welcome back. Hope you had a nice tisky. Nice little break. Um, and so um, if you had a um, hand up before, we, uh, before the break, uh, please stick your hand up again and I'll recognize you and I'll come straight to you. Okie dokie, yeah, familiar faces popping up. Okay, so I'm gonna go to gentleman in the fourth row, one in. Um, if you can stand up and speak up, that'd be great because our radio mic is a com complete nightmare. <laughs> Hello. Oh. Uh, so I'm going to uh, break down the question of UBI a little bit. First of all, think about how, what it means to make UBI demand right now. So what's the kind of impact of the left looking like it has answers to legitimacy, which at the moment it doesn't really often seem like it does. So there's, regardless of the actual kind of practicalities of this limitation, the fact that making the demand itself is important. Then what does it do to political strategy? If you've got uh, an issue that unifies most of the population. I mean, one of the problems that we face on the left is fragmentation, that we don't have to fight, we fight on so many different fronts. That's a UBI that gives you a central demand that is both trying to be universally contested as well as universally contested. 
Um, the third thing I had is about the geography of perception and what's going to happen with automation. So obviously with machines, you don't have the uh, undercutting of labor costs that you get. Uh, at the moment, we have a lot of production to try it. It's cheaper to produce that. You can have 3D printer in the UK, it's not going to make any difference whether it's in the UK or China. So what does that do to the geography of production? How does that impact, say, tax revenue? How does that impact uh, the geography of migration? And this is back to how you be able to the distribution I'm going to take two other questions and then we're going to answer them in groups. Um, down the front. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I want to talk about um, funding. Um, do you guys know about the financial transaction tax or another way of uh, taxing to fund this university? That would be really nice and cool and great. Um, yeah, basically. I mean, if we don't know about it, we might have to come back to you. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> Be prepared. And um, just do I end of patience right there in front of Larry? I'm super stoked that we can all agree that the final aim is socialising the entire economy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm really pleased about that. But my question for the panel is, in the short term, how do we deal with inflation? And how do we avoid running into the problem that we have with the minimum wage? Is it's constantly catching up with the economy growth? Okay, so we have oh, <laughs> failing to catch up. Yeah, um, so we have, I guess, four questions. Uh, one is about, uh, I guess, a question of discourse and tactics. So, what does it mean to make the demand in this political, uh, this particular political moment? Um, what does it, um, and is it potentially a discursive victory to have everyone unifying around this, uh, around this one cause, even though, even accepting that it's potentially. Um, you know, not the silver bullet. Uh, what happens to the geography of production um, in these projected cases of technological revolution? Uh, how do we how do we fund universal basic income? And um, what's the sh what's the effect of um, universal basic income in terms of uh, inflation? And how do we prevent it just being, you know, its its value being inflated away as our you know, for instance, as is the wage uh, rise in minimum wage that we're seeing. Has just come in. Um, I'm going to go over to uh, Jeremy. Funding, financial transaction tax. What's that all about? Okay. Well, the financial transaction tax is more normally uh, referred to as the Tobin tax, uh, named after its inventor. I mean, for, I mean, for a long time, um, you know, uh, the, the proposal historically is that FTT would be used for um, as a way of offsetting the effects of sort of globalisation, especially on um, uh, economies in the global south. So the historic, uh, the historic proposal of organisations like ATTAC in uh, France, who were a very big, significant kind of radical organisation at the end of the 90s, was that a financial transaction tax would actually be used, would actually be a kind of globally administered in some way, in order, uh, primarily as a way of uh, redistributing wealth from the global north to the global south. Uh, and I, would, I tend to think that you know, if there was going to be one, um, I'd probably rather it was used for that. Uh, personally, and I, I think there are other ways of funding UBI. I mean, I'm open to anything, but I think, for example, the Varoufakis proposal that we heard about earlier, the universal dividend, would be, you know, a, a good way and an appropriate way of funding um, UBI. Um, you know, there are lots of ways. As, I, as I'm always saying to people, look, we, we're half a mile away from the, arguably the biggest tax haven on the planet, the city of London. You know, th there's an awful lot of capital there that could, that, and an awful lot of reserves an income which, if it was subject to anything like normal regulations, anything like you know, internationally normal standards of accountability and taxability, would easily fund uh, at the universal basic income for everybody in the UK. And when it comes to the dividend, though, does that not kind of depend on the health of some potentially destructive industries? For instance, if you're using... Uh, I don't know, uh, yeah, polluting if industries or, you know, tobacco or whatever. If you implement it badly, but, you know, that's... You know, ev every yes but you can say about any policy anybody can think of, you can say, yeah, if you implement it badly, it will have bad effects. But so, you know, so, so will socialism, you know, as we have seen over the course of the 20th century. If you implement that badly, it can have some pretty bad effects. So, I think... <laughs> the, the joy of an understatement. Um, <laughs> and um, going on to the idea of, like, whether it's, uh, I guess, a symbolic victory to be able to... You know, unify around universal basic income. Is that um, perhaps not a point in its favour, Alex? 
Well, I'm not in favour of universal basic income, so no, I don't think it is. Um, <laughs> But no, but the, the, idea of the, the idea that it um, tables that a kind of decoupling of uh, the right to live from the duty to work, surely that's, well, that's, that's a kind of important thing to be talking about. Yeah, absolutely. That's a long-term demand of the a li libertarian demand of the socialist movement from William Morris, well, before William Morris, but, you know, uh, through William Morris, through uh, the... All, all of the arts and craft movement, the idea of abolishing the distinction between leisure and uh, between art and, and work, uh, the, the, you know, liberating the human, the human creative desire. The point about it is <laughs> that Marxists and the left understand that that limitation is placed on the human desire by capitalism. And UBI isn't proposing to do away with capitalism, as Aaron has admitted um, earlier. So I don't see really that this is a way of... <laughs> I don't see really that this is a way to liberate human creativity. Can I say something about the geography of production? I'm just going to come back to you on one thing, because you, um, I want to come over to Joanna, because what you s you're saying is that, well, okay, Marxists and the left understand this, but obviously we're not talking about Marxists and the left, surely, if we want to win. I, I recognise, like, 40% of people in this room, that's not a good thing um, if we're talking about expanding the left. And we need, perhaps, perhaps as you were saying... Uh, that UBI could play a role in this sort of expanding. Yeah, no, because UBI is, in a, is a philosophical idea, stands against like this idea that our lives should be purely about work, right? That we'll, I think it says, you know, we'll give you money. You don't have to put everything into that. There are other pl ways of doing things. There are other things that are worthwhile. Work has, you know, other meanings. I mean, I, I just think. This old idea of just workers just wage labour is just not that's just not happening now. Everything's changing. Yeah, but I mean, do, do you think it could, I mean, have that kind of a, a, a widespread resonance as you were kind of intimating earlier? Because it's, I mean, it sounds a bit wonky, doesn't it? Universal basic income, like, what's that about? But um, I mean, perhaps it, perhaps it does. It can form the basis of some kind of populist platform. Yeah, I do think you can do that. I mean, that's why I was trying to link it with the wages for housework in that way, that can be seen as that way. There are lots of other ways of seeing it. Like, I, I think an eco way of seeing it is, is also a really useful way. Less work, less people getting on, you know, like, l less kind of use of energy, of fossil fuels to do things, like staying at home, like that sort of thing. Like, and uh, this idea of a low growth economy too, like that, it could feed into that. Like, I, I think there are lots of ways of both using it outwards and sort of people coming inwards towards it together. Mm. Solidarity and whatever, you know. So I'm going to come back to you on the geography of production and then I'm going to go over to Aaron. Well, I, ju I just think that uh, that question is very pertinent because we need to unpack exactly how UBI, the proponents of UBI propose to pay for UBI. So obviously it's paid for out of state taxes, it's state expenditure. And the state needs to raise that expenditure. So there are various proposals for how that could happen. But one of the ones that's been put around quite a lot uh, is that in addition to existing income tax and corporation tax, there would be an automation tax on firms. So effectively, the deal that UBI or proponents of UBI are making with employers is your largest, in, in, many, in many cases, your largest single uh, area of expenditure is wage labour, wage costs. We will allow you to reduce your wage costs by introducing automation and we will cushion you against what would normally be expected to be the impact of that, which would be mass unemployment and social instability by paying UBI. But in order to do that we will tax you with an automation tax and firms would be measured according to what degree of automation they had achieved. So for example, if you measured it on a scale of zero to one, a firm which had achieved 100% automation would be taxed at 100% of an automation tax. Uh, a firm that had semi-automated might, might be taxed at 50% of an automation tax. Now, this presupposes that firms won't behave in exactly the way they behave at the moment, which is by offshoring production to escape taxes. 
Uh, so Starbucks, Amazon, you know, ev everyone else you've ever heard of who sends their head, gets a brass plate in Dublin and pretends that that's where, their, um, that's where the majority of their sales take place. So what UBI's proponents are actually saying is they're going to stop the free movement of capital and labour, which I fully support. But if I was going to do it, I wouldn't introduce UBI. I would take state control of strategic industries. I would tax employers uh, at a punitive level. Uh, and I would introduce proper welfare reforms. I would fund tertiary education for free the way it used to be funded uh, before the current generation uh, suffered uh, student fees and all the rest of it. So I think that people have to be a bit honest about what UBI's proponents are actually saying about the geography of production. They're saying in order to make UBI work, you have to lock down firms. And I think a lot of people who might be sympathetic to some of the ideas of UBI haven't perhaps understood that. Um, Aaron, would you like to come back on that? Yes, yeah, so um, there's a couple of... When I was talking about Marx and moving from the freedom of necessity, the realm of necessity to the realm of freedom, that's capital volume three, right? <laughs> now... I, I honestly haven't now, got that far. So. <laughs> now we're going to move to the Grundrisse, because he talks in the Grundrisse... <laughs> It's true. He talks on the Grundrisse about two things. He says that over time, the worker's position becomes increasingly like that of the, the night watchman. He says he literally uses the word superintending production, literally looking over a production process, which is increasingly automated. There's also a line... You, you, you're signaling. What is it? Oh, they, they've got questions for later. Don't all worry right, about okay, it. Sorry. I thought it was because I thought the sound was going to sing. It's all good. And then, so you're superintending the production, and then in addition to that, there's another part in the Grundrisse later on where he says, he talks about over time how variable capital workers are replaced by fixed capital. Okay, it's been happening for two, since the Luddites, right? And he says, capital here quite unintentionally re reduces labor to a minimum. This is the condition of emancipated labor, briefly paraphrasing it. So he says, actually, the process whereby machines, automation, AI, over time replaces the variable capital, human labor, he says, under capitalism, this is dreadful. Under communism, it's the condition of emancipated labor. That is, labor which no longer has to work. That is, the release from the bonds of scarcity, which determine the entirety of history until communism. Okay? So I think Marx, I'm not saying he'd like UBI, but the, the conversations we're having today around automation, around changing perhaps the lexicon and the strategies of the left, responding to automation, I think have to pick up from there. And I think the ones of the 50s, the 60s, the 70s are very limited, and I think the UBI feeds into that. Mm -hmm. In terms of how you'd fund it, you're looking at hundreds of billions of pounds, right? So you can't just say, oh, yeah, you know, you know the tuition fees will be 12 billion pounds, right? UBI would be huge. So how would you fund it? First of all, lots more people would be raised into certain tax brackets, so we can't really model it particularly well. Lots more people would be paying tax on the money they would get. They'd be paying back straight away all the money they're getting from UBI anyway, right? Wealthier people. But you'd still be looking at, let's say, 100 billion plus. Uh, some of that would then come out of JSA, uh, disability, if this is a, quite a, you know, a, a large amount of money and everybody's getting it. And then we have a conversation about to what extent does it replace existing welfare benefits. I think you'd probably have to have an estates tax, because Alex is right, you know, capital is so mobile, labor is so mobile, I think it would have to be on things that can't move. So I would say you'd probably have to have an increased, I would argue, for a consumption tax, which is higher for wealthier people. So it would be, say, 15% for items below a certain amount of money, 30 40% for items above a certain amount of money. We have it with income tax, why not with consumption tax? But if, you, if you're just talking about um, things that can't move, that pretty much, like... No, consumption, you're buying things in Britain. Yeah, but I mean, it, it, you're not what, what are we doing about, about the city of London? That's all about, you know, free-moving capital, Oh, no, we're socialising finance. I mean, I've already said that. Okay, yeah. cool, yeah. We're socialising finance. <laughs> I mean, we're doing lots of uh, things. But in terms of, you know, but it's a okay. really serious argument. In a no. context of globalization, how do you fund things? And estates tax and taxes on consumption for the rich, I think, are probably the exclusive means by which you can do it. Okie dokie. Um, so um, we're, we're going, can we just pick up on uh, the question on inflation quickly? And then I'm going to, uh, there are sort of five or six or, oh my God, a dozen hands um, going up. Um, a gentleman asked about um, how we, how we combat the effects of inflation were UBI to be suddenly introduced. 
Either of you? I, you, I mean, you, but you seem very reluctant, but it would be, be great if one, someone could answer. Uh, well, into again, the fire, yeah. there we go. This is, just, this is the question which, you know, does, again, is just not a question which is specific to UBI. It's mm. a question which applies to any attempt to uh, you know, improve incomes across the board without just completely transforming the relation to production. So, I mean, in a sense, I say, you know, it's not a question just for UBI advocates. It's a question for anybody um, who wants to, who's interested in this, in this issue. I mean, broadly speaking, I think it does speak to um, the difficulty of implementing any kind of genuinely radical economic program on a purely national basis. I mean, and personally, I, I'm very skeptical, I'm very dubious that any of what we're talking about today is actually uh, implementable you know, purely on a national scale, um, which I realize is not something people want to hear, because given, it is the, a bit of a bummer, yeah. given where we are now, <laughs> you know, given, given the politics of the European Union, you know, it's pretty obvious that we're a long way away from being imp able to implement any kind of radical program, even at a kind of a European regional level. I also think the fact that something's difficult doesn't mean it's not necessary. In fact, you know, sometimes we have to accept the difficulty of those things and how long they're going to take to achieve. And, and I think and that's... I mean, it was also tabled in the European Union as, you know, <laughs> that... That's sure, okay. sure. I'm, I'm, just, I'm already know. talking about it in the past tense. But, um, yeah, as, as a kind of Euro dividend. So it's not like there's no historical precedent for this kind of um, transnational programme. Right. Um, but I think that's the, that's the level at which these things have to be addressed. I mean, all of the historical evidence, again, going back to the beginning of the 1980s, is that any attempt to implement socialism in one country is going to fail. It's going to fail for reasons which were already entirely predictable to any good Marxist in the 1890s, again. So. Um, <laughs> cheery. Um, <laughs> okay, so I've got... Um, could you, could you stick your hands up incredibly high because I'm being blinded by a kind of Gatsby and green light? Um, uh, okay, gonna ha go like in the front here, um, over just waving at me right from the back, and uh, her with the with the pink wristband. I realise that's all of you, but that one. <laughs> um, sorry, that was that was the most unhelpful criteria I could pick. Um, okay, go for it. Yes, yes, yourself. <laughs> is not going to change the gender, the gender balance of gender relationships straight away, but it gives us, insofar as, as money, gives, money is freedom in this society, it gives us that little bit of freedom to say either no, I mean domestic violence has not been brought up yet, and the, and the absolute necessity that women have to be able to be partners, which they do not have. I, sorry, I just, I, I didn't mean to speak so quickly, but I, it's just, 
this is something that, you know, when I, when I go out on the street with this and talk to people about it, it's that little chink of light, you know, that I can imagine a different world. And the thing is, you know, after 40, 30, 40 years of fighting cuts and being on the defensive tack, this is something which pushes the, pushes the argument forward, makes people think about their lives, makes people think about work, makes think, you know, not just their paid work, but also all the unpaid work which we do. And that's not just women, it's also men. Yes, women do the bulk of it, for sure. But I mean, it's something that, that for me is really about giving people more choices and, and, and about, you know, sort of encouraging people's uh, motivation to do other things with their lives. the last speaker, yeah. what I'd like to see is maybe, you know, as a thought experiment, we could actually say, like, let's iron out the conversation about whether a UBI is a good thing or a possible thing or whatever, and we actually accept that it's maybe an orientation for the movement. How do we get there? What is the strategy that we as, like, social movement actors or people involved in, like, labour movements need to put in place to actually achieve this? <laughs> Because I totally agree with the last speaker on the basis that I think this thing is fucking coming. It's probably going to come. But it's not going to be on our fucking terms, right? So we need to get our shit together. So let's orientate this conversation towards that and not hypothetical conversations about it. Yeah, there we go. Um, I'm a art teacher. I'm interested in uh, UBI and the possibilities for education. We're seeing the arts and education really coming under attack at the moment. And we're seeing increased corporatisation of education generally. And I'm just wondering what you think, what you can fix there, what effect that would have on education to so give people more choices. And so should the quantity in quality as well. Okay, great. So we have uh, the question of economic rent um, and the necessity of. Sorry, I'm just, I'm just that wave. Um, uh, and because uh, some people have uh, proposed UBI as a kind of positive rent that can be recouped as a way of uh, combating the, the enormous. That's all right. Don't worry. People have been divided, all right? That's what's happened over the last 40 years. As the, the taxes have immensely gone down, yeah. all right, we've been more and more divided between the people who pay taxes and the people who, who use services. Join the panel. Yeah, you should join the panel. Actually, do you want to come up? Do you want to come up? Actually, come up. Actually, come up. Sorry. <laughs> Welcome. What's your name? What's your name? Would you like to introduce yourself? My name's Barb Jacobson. Cool. Yeah. Oh, I've, I've read your work. Let's give her a hand. So, um, I mean, economic rent. Go for it. Okay, no, I mean, my point is, is that what we've, we've been divided as a society by the, I mean, the neoliberal project has basically been about um, decreasing taxes, ma you know, making it easier and easier for capitalists to accumulate. All right. This is not, you know, this is not an accident that we're in, you know, in the point we're in right now, and that, you know, UBI really, I think, has to be has to be positioned as something that attacks the economic rents, and there's a way to uh, to get that back. Now, it may be like what Aaron was talking about that we'll need a demurrage currency, a currency that decreases in value, or a separate currency. I'm really all for uh, just completely saying, well, all the money in tax havens that is actually worthless now. We're going to make our own economic system. <laughs> but anyway, the but point is, is to get, is to stop this divide, all right? You know, it used to be that we thought, I prefer the term social dividend because we all, we all deserve a share of what's, of what's going on in society. Um, but when we were talking about, um, I guess, these quite, you know, like, ambitious projects, and obviously they should be ambitious projects, but that mm. kind of brings us back to the uh, question that came from the middle. 
of that, um, which was, okay, let's sort of park these hypotheticals for a moment. You know, what do we do in terms of what if UBI happens next month, next year? You know, how do we respond to the neoliberal terms on which that will, be, in which it will be constructed? We how have do we to get be our fighting for war. We have to say, well, yeah, okay, but you yeah, know, but actually, we want this, this, and this as well. All right, and it's not just, you know, I just don't. I, you know, I'm from the left. I'm from the Wages for Housework campaign originally. All right, you know, in sort of dealing with these questions, we don't, we simply don't have the power to really oppose anything right now. All right, and that's, that's, you know, in terms of a strategy to get it, I mean, we're working through civil society groups. We do have some unions on board. We have, you know, we're, talk, you know, we're talking to churches. We're talking to educational institutions. All right, you know, and that's how we're building support for it. All right, I, I also, and But when you talk about it um, being able to fight for more, this obviously depends on the idea that the labor force will be empowered by UBI. And it was, as Alex has um, pointed out, if it completely replaces the welfare state, that's not necessarily the case, right? If, even mm. if we get like 10 grand a year each, if housing benefits gone, if you know, job seekers allowance is gone, that's, that doesn't come anywhere near to, to replacing it. No, you know, not it's even certainly going to be a people. huge improvement so on job seekers allowance, all right? I mean, you cannot not but improve on, so on job seekers allowance right now. So, Joanna, you know, and tax not, credits. Not, it's not tax a, credits that are actually keeping, keeping wages low right now. Joanna, would you like to come back in on that? On the question of organizing or the Yeah, question on the question of, um, I guess, the, the political urgency of the moment and how do we, how do we um, organize around um, UBI, like, yeah. as, will, as will happen in the next, you know, five years, ten years? Well, I'm interested in what you said about Europe, because um, obviously Europe is changing quite a lot, and we're getting this position where Germany and France are sort of pushing back against a hard Brexit and what, what sort of leadership will be possible under these a new two leaders of this, these elections this year. And I, I, it's not always clear to me that Europe are very... Well, we've seen it in the great Greek debt crisis, that Europe aren't always kind of open and um, charitable or seeing what's going on. And it, but it's, it's interesting to me that you've said that you, Europe is a good place for... has been a good place for you organising. I thought that's what you, I understood no, no, what no, you were saying. I've, I've been organising. I've been organising on the European level. All right. That means that we have been in Brussels. We have been talking to people in the in the Parliament there. Yeah. We've been talking to various bodies. All right. And and I mean they're worried about the about automation. They're worried about the crisis of work. They're also actually starting to talk about lifting the burden of tax away from uh, earned income. I mean, that's, you know, but I'm not saying I believe it, to be honest, all right? It's not a, you know, <laughs> but we do have to have some kind of transnational organization, which is why I've been organizing on this level, as well as in BN. And I just uh, think um, we, it's overstated when they say that Europe is the last defender against Trump or whatever. I just no. don't really feel like that is at all what's happening. Um. Yeah, no, they, they kill migrants too. Yeah. Um, uh, but, so for Alex, um, okay, say UBI comes in, Next week, tomorrow. Apart from. I feel from like I told you so. Pardon? <laughs> <laughs> you give it a month or something. Yeah. <laughs> Apart from putting Jeremy in protective custody, what's, <laughs> what's the next step? Well, I, I'd like to uh, reference the point that Barb just made about the need to tax economic rents because I think that that is a really uh, significant and central point. And I don't think that universal income benefit does that. Uh, I think there are ways to do that, and we ought to talk about land value tax. Um, I mean, that's a, something that's been argued for for 100 years, and it, in somewhere like the City of London, where you've got projects like Crossrail uh, taking place, or HS2, which are you know, radically changing the ability of firms to uh, earn money from the, the land that they occupy, you know, that should be taxed and that would generate huge amounts of wealth. I completely agree with you. I don't see the connection between that and the demand for UBI. Um, I actually want to briefly go over to Aaron on the question of education and then throw it open. So, um, yeah, it's a fantastic question. I would say that this is a really, I'd say, a paradigmatic example, actually, where if you introduce UBI, you would have a bunch of things all of a sudden subtracted from both the logic of the state and of the market production. And education is one of them. I think you see an explosion of autodidactism, of self-education, 
um, you know, learning that looks very different from what we currently think of in universities and in schools. And it wouldn't just be pencil and paper, you know, it'd be handicraft, it would be sports, yoga, languages, coding, whatever. But I think that that would allow a certain amount of the labor market to pull itself out. And like I said before, engage in new modes of production, new production models, and other people to also try new forms of consumption. Again, maybe that's a, a dichotomy the left doesn't like to talk about, but it's important. Um, so, it, yeah. If, I mean, if it did come in in the sort of current political landscape, it's not necessarily a guarantee that it wouldn't no. lead to more marketization of education, precisely no, I mean, under the, the rubric of choice. Of that, yeah. yeah, so well, we I mean, that. what do we... Well, in terms of the, the political terrain, if it came in next week, you know, well, first of all, you could go to your Labour branch and pass a motion, okay? <laughs> that would be the first thing to do. Um, no, but seriously, it would have to be contested, obviously, at every level of society. And I, I, think that's, I think that's what you're saying is correct. I think it's almost inevitable it's going to come in this form in the next five to ten years. We already see something like it in Germany. Uh, after, again, the Svansik Zen, after the Schroeder government, it was a social democratic government that did this. It's a kind of, you know, it's a... a a protean version of it, exactly right. So I think it's inevitable, and actually that discussion around this being a terrain and how do you, whether you agree with Alex, whether you agree with Joanna or I or, you know, uh, Jeremy, how do you see this as a terrain for contestation and, and to kind of repurpose um, that set of policies for a more progressive politics, I guess. Okay, great. Um, I'm gonna have three final questions. Um, and I'm sorry to everyone I didn't get to you can, you know, join in on the, um, like, on the Barney on Twitter that's probably happening right now, um, uh, and hashtag Navarra IRL, and that's going to... Oh, or at the party afterwards. There's a party afterwards. Um, oh, I'm so sorry. I am actually going slightly short-sighted, so that's what I'm blaming right now. Um, okay, so um, one and... you and um, mm -mm -mm. I am just trying to pick randomly and geographically so uh, okay very v like very very back hello yes I'm waving at you cool
send far more things going back over to the other side, to, 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 to countries where production costs are cheaper. Thank you. And to round us off, yeah. you might have to shout. Yeah, I would try to do that. Um, Marco, we are organizing in uh, West London in warehouses and food factories mainly, so that's our kind of uh, background in that sense. Um, I think, Jeremy, you said like uh, it's semi-delusional to ask the question of, uh, let's say, control over production at the moment. But I would turn the question around like um, UBI is mainly addressing the radical left. I mean, that's kind of uh, our audience. So. Uh, what kind of period are we facing? Do we actually believe that at some point we are on a plain kind of plain field of uh, everyone, the illegal migrant, uh, the, the woman on the on the uh, ready meal uh, assembly line, uh, the industrial worker being on on the same wage, and we can all organize together and have a lot of time? Is that the period we're facing, or is it more like maybe in the time of the early IWW, working 12 hours, having to organize within that kind of uh, framework, being threatened with uh, deportation or our squad being evicted and do you have to actually kind of base our strategy on these kind of daily struggles and uh, how we can overcome the hierarchies in the, in, the, in the working class rather than thinking okay at some point we all get our pocket money and we have our time and can organize. I think that's not what we are facing. So in that sense I think the UBI debate is kind of divisive in that sense and um, basically yeah to, to conclude um, I would say the challenge is we're facing struggles with, a back to, uh, with our back to the wall. I mean, if you look in the, in the US, how can we, with the richness that is currently in the working class, let's say, all over the world, through supply chains, through kind of migration, through a kind of a narrowing down of the division of, uh, between intellectual and manual labor, how can we ask the question of control under these defensive struggles. That will be the challenge of the left, not some kind of great plan of dropping some money on people. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm gonna go to Jeremy. So where does this leave the, the rest of the world? Is it the case that the UBI is a kind of luxury f available only to like developed nations in necessary scare quotes and do we see a reiteration of the terms of like the colonial terms of the early welfare state well the question you know i think we're concerned with today is is ubi potentially useful as a demand for the radical left uh, in the context that we actually find ourselves in and the, the context we actually find ourselves in is you know, a broadly you know is a set of political debates which you know are framed in, although we want to move beyond that for reasons that you know, I and others have spoken about are broadly framed in a sort of national context. So, I really don't think I don't really think it's here or there. I mean, we, if we, you know, it's part. You know, the question is: Is the UBI useful as part of a program, which, of course, would also include trying to mobilise solidarity for comrades in the global south and trying to, uh, you know, get people to adopt a more internationalist and global perspective. I mean, of course, we would want that to be part of the program. The question is. Sorry, they are demanding this, all right? I mean, you know, it's, it's a demand that's, that's caught fire in India and in, in Southern Africa, particularly in terms of resource rents. You know, so I mean, this idea that, oh, well, we'll get it, but nobody else will is a little bit, you know, it's actually probably more likely in Korea, for example, where one of the, the candidates is supporting UBI, for, you know, the, one of the presidential candidates is supporting UBI. I mean, you know, just talking about China, it's interesting. I mean, w one thing that I found out last year was that, that because the country owns the, pro you know, owns the land, some of the, some, of the, um, some of the areas in China have made the deal that rather than just hand over their land rights to developers, they've, they've basically allowed the developers to, do, to, to develop the land, but then they get the rents from it. And so, you know, in some communities in China, you effectively have a UBI. So. Um. And what do we, I guess, wanted to, oh, hello, yes, was that a hand? Yep, go for it. So yeah, picking up from what I said at the beginning, you said, is the environment we're now confronting the same as that which confronted the IWW at the beginning of the 20th century? No, because the beginning of the 20th century was the expansion of capitalist social relations to the whole world. The ethic, the society of work, right, was being universalized. What we're now seeing in the global south is something fundamentally different. We're seeing ever larger surplus populations which capitalism has no need for, be it through consumption or production. 
and I think what I said in terms of automation changing the developmental trajectory means that those larger populations in Nigeria, in Bangladesh, in Pakistan, Pakistan and Bangladesh between them, by 2050, you have a large population in the whole EU. Nigeria is going to have 400 million people by, by 2050. If these countries don't develop, right, in terms of how we understand, you know, how Korea went or China went, or even to a lesser extent parts of India, there are huge problems being pent up there. So I think, no, I think it's actually quite different. And if you look at a country like the DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo, have huge mineral wealth. There's a, a metal there which creates a component called um, tantalum, which is in all of your smartphones, right? And the DRC is one of the few places in the world where you can get it. Now, a great demand for the people of the DRC is not, by the way, I believe in open borders. I think they should be able to come and work here. I think that's a, a great strategy for eradicating poverty through remitt remittances in the global south. But a huge demand for them is socializing this wealth and giving a universal payout like we had in Alaska. Alaska's oil wealth meant a payout to every Alaskan citizen, I think $1,000 a year or something. And that's a great demand for the people of the DRC. That's a great demand for the people of Mongolia, huge mineral wealth in a lot of these countries in the global south. So severing the chains of dependence will be what ends colonialism, right? I believe in freedom of movement. These people can come here, they can work here, send money back home, great. But that's not going to solve the problems of poverty in the global south. 1.5 million children every year die from the bacteria associated with diarrhea. 1.5 million. A couple of people coming to Britain, Germany, Italy is not going to solve that. That requires a global effort, technology transfer, huge amounts of capital transfer. Uh, that's a separate conversation. And yes, of course, they should be able to come here. But God, that's not even a sticking plaster, you know? And if the, if the best of the left can say around the, these crises is open borders, mm, well, we're really letting them down. Sorry. Me too. But um, in the face of these crises, as um, our first questioner was, um, was asking, um, the UBI perhaps uh, seems a little fragile to demand of our political institutions. So should we be um, looking for a more robust transformation of, of the way we work that can't be just kind of wished away by a, you know, an unsympathetic government? Um, well, I think uh, the one of the themes that came out of just these questions and what we're saying is mm. that it, UBI... <laughs> UBI has to be backed with a kind of leftist program, right? And also this sense of, I, I thought the question was so interesting and intelligent, but in some ways, like, if we have the UBI, we have to think of other ways of organizing. Maybe we wouldn't, we, maybe we wouldn't ask for like a shorter work week. Maybe we would ask for different things. Maybe we would be able to defend the UBI in some particular way. Maybe there is other ways of organizing that we can't even imagine because we can't even imagine getting this thing that we kind of can half imagine tonight, you know? Like, it doesn't seem, I think we might have to think differently, basically. Care to think differently, Alex? Yeah, I, I think I'd think differently from most of the people on the panel. Um, <laughs> I, 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 th I think that the, the woman who spoke over there, and I couldn't see exactly who, it, yes, you, uh, was, was right that we ought to have um, an ambitious plan to shorten the working week, radically shorten the working week, and to redistribute work. And to redistribute interesting work, we should be highly suspicious, and we should fight attempts by corporations and firms to automise jobs that are socially useful, which they're trying to do at the moment. My union's involved in a number of high-profile strikes across the length and breadth of the rail network because rail companies are being funded by the Department for Transport to get rid of guards from trains. You know, all passenger surveys show that passengers who pay huge amounts of money for their rail tickets want a guard on a train to ensure their safety, but they're being promoted by uh, private corporations, being encouraged by the Department for Transport to automise new train new train operations without guards. Now, this is something we should be mobilising to oppose, not regarding as some kind of inevitable uh, outcome of technology. Technology is not neutral. Technology is simply the instrument of whichever class, whichever class interest is powerful enough to control it. And that's what we've got to get a grip on. So let's... The most, the most egalitarian, the most liberating, the most redistributive way to spread income is through spreading work. People who are in work, who are able to earn income, able to organize at the point of production, have power 
and they're able to come, get out of poverty quicker than any other methodology, much quicker than through the welfare state or through universal basic income uh, giving them money. Lynette, uh, final thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I could totally agree with the shorter working week for sure. Um, the problem is, all right, legislating for it. All right, you can legislate for it or you can actually demand, you know, I don't know what your vision is like to get it actually from each individual workplace or whether, you know, what we've had to deal with is, is also people trying to legislate for a shorter working week. And, and the fact of the matter is, and what I think the Brexit vote also showed is that you don't have, you don't have power if you don't have some money, okay? People do not have access to all those lovely human rights that, you know, that, are, that people supposedly have from the, from the EU because they don't have money to access it. Unless you have institutional support or you have lots of money, it's, you can't go to the court of law. I'm dealing a lot with people who don't have money to pay for a lawyer to help them in tribunal. So a lot of my work involves um, you know, m making people ready to get there. We have an 80% su you know, success rate at that, but my job shouldn't even have to fucking exist, all right? It Amen. shouldn't have to exist. I want to be made redundant. That's my, that's my goal, all right? And, you know, with, with UBI, all right? And I mean, I, you know, certainly, I mean, all the things you said, Alex, I mean, you know, and certainly in terms of, you know, we have to decide what is useful, you know, what is useful. It's not about shit jobs and better jobs and stuff. It's about what are, you know, what are jobs, you know, what are the things we need to do as a society? And what are the things, you know, because we've got this kind of thing at the moment where actually income and work are already decoupled. All right, you've got a situation, you know, City of London, I stare at it a lot. All right, it's, you know, the people down there, if they disappeared, who would notice? All right, and they get the most money. All right, the people, the people who are doing the socially useful things are getting less money. The people who are doing, you know, damaging things are, are getting more. All right, and that's, I think, really the question that we're dealing with. Yeah. I think that's a, I think that's a wrap. Thank you so much for coming. And I'd like to thank Aaron, Alex, Jeremy, Joanna, and Bob. <laughs>